This millionaire is robbing a bank, but oddly, after snatching half a million in cash, he shows no intention of fleeing, he seems to be deliberately stalling for time, engaging in small talk with the bank manager, chatting about this and that, not until the police arrive does he surrender calmly and composedly, as if all this was part of his plan all along, this handsome man is none other than Michael, the heartthrob and originator of the prison break, who has charmed thousands of young women, the greatness of the American TV series Prison Break needs no further explanation, it can be said that no other show has created such a frenzy, and for many, it was their introduction to American TV dramas. In court, Michael forgoes all defense, Veronica, a defense lawyer with a deep connection to Michael, can't understand why a talented graduate from a prestigious school like Michael, who obviously isn't lacking money, would do something as foolish as robbing a bank, furthermore, he relinquishes all rights, solely focused on getting incarcerated. What could Michael's true purpose be? Ultimately, the court sentences Michael to five years in a maximum security prison. Michael has only one request to be incarcerated as close to home as possible, namely the notorious Fox River State Penitentiary. At this moment, Veronica finally guesses his real intention, hearing the judge's agreement to his request. A subtle smile appears on Michael's lips. On his first day in prison, Michael meets the fearsome head of the guards, Captain Bellick. Here, next to the warden, he wields the greatest power. Anyone who dares to cross Bellick is in for a fate worse than death. Michael's cellmate is the warm-hearted Sucre, serving time for armed robbery and due for release in 16 months. Sucre shows him around the prison, this old man holding a cat is D.B. Cooper, 30 years ago. He had one dollar, five million and has refused to admit it ever since. This black man runs the prison's underground market. For the right price, he can get you anything. In this prison, the law of the jungle prevails. With the black and white gangs at constant odds, it's best not to provoke them. But Michael seems uninterested in all this. He only cares about one person Lincoln Burroughs. Sucre is momentarily stunned but still introduces Michael to this highly dangerous individual. Allegedly. This man murdered the vice president's brother and is scheduled for the electric chair in a month. As a man facing death, Lincoln is capable of anything, making him the most dangerous man in prison. The guards keep Lincoln isolated, only letting him out for labor on Wednesdays. Curious. Sucre wonders why Michael is interested in such a person on his first day. However, Michael's response leaves him dumbfounded. Because he's my brother. The next day. During yard time, Michael approaches the prison boss, John Abruzzi. John was once a mafia boss. He manages the prison factory by bribing the guards and enjoys certain privileges within the prison. This prison factory allows inmates to do menial tasks like painting walls and cleaning toilets, which, though grueling, is better than being cooped up in a cell. Many inmates are desperate to get in, and Michael's brother, Lincoln, is working there. To get close to his brother, Michael approaches John, hoping he can help him get in. After finishing his words, Michael took out an origami crane and placed it on the table. John was immediately baffled. Do you think I'm a teenage girl? You think a paper crane will get you a green light from me? He thought. So John unceremoniously asked his men to kick Michael out. Michael was casually chatting with Sucre in their cell. When unexpectedly, Warden Pope summoned Michael for a talk. Sucre sensed trouble brewing. In this place, no one had ever caught Pope's attention unless Michael had piqued his interest in some way. It turned out that Pope had already investigated Michael's background. A top talent from the world-renowned University of Chicago, with outstanding grades, and after graduation, a renowned structural engineer, Pope couldn't fathom why someone like Michael would rob a bank. However, Michael simply made a vague comment. Everyone turns up one sooner or later. Seeing that there was nothing to ask, Pope didn't beat around the bush. There are just a few months left until his 40th wedding anniversary with his wife. And he has been building a model of the Taj Mahal as a symbol of his love for her. But the more he worked on it, the more he realized it was about to collapse. That's where I was hoping you could be of assistance. And for the favor, I can offer you three days of work a week in here, and it'll keep you off the yard. Normally, currying favor with Pope was something both inmates and guards would jump at. But Michael flatly refused. He had more important things to do, and wouldn't waste his time on this. They went through here. Guard! Meanwhile, 
John received a call from his subordinates outside. They had received an anonymous letter with a photo of a key witness who could incriminate them, along with a paper crane. The police had the witness under secret protection, and though they wanted to eliminate this witness, they couldn't find the location. John remembered Michael and the paper crane he had brought two days earlier. It was clear that Michael must know the witness's location. John immediately went to find him, but Michael wasn't going to easily divulge anything. A fight broke out between them. In such a place, there's no such thing as self-defense. Any retaliation would lead to solitary confinement. John was also starting to panic. If Michael got thrown into solitary, he wouldn't be able to get the witness's address, and he would be facing the death penalty. So, he agreed to get Michael into the prison factory, but Pope was unusually angry about this incident and immediately declared that Michael would be in solitary for 90 days. By then, Lincoln would have already been executed. Having no other choice, Michael agreed to repair the Taj Mahal model for Pope. You want to buy when, June? Yes. Then we better get started, wouldn't you say? With both sides of the story taken care of, all he had to do was wait for Wednesday's group work so he could see his brother. Next on Michael's list to approach was Sarah, the prison's female doctor. Michael had already investigated Sarah and found out she was the daughter of the current governor, working in the prison due to a fallout with her father, doing the job she loved. Michael, under the pretense of being diabetic, came here to inject insulin, chatting with Sarah to build rapport while occasionally glancing out the window to plan his escape route. The problem was that he didn't actually have diabetes, and excessive insulin injections caused his hands to tremble uncontrollably. Even Sarah began to doubt whether he really had diabetes, so she suggested doing a checkup the next time Michael came. To address this urgent issue, Michael approached Benjamin, seeking pills that could counteract the insulin. After receiving the money, Benjamin started arranging for it. Finally, Wednesday arrived and Michael got to see his brother Lincoln as he hoped. While changing clothes, Michael asked Lincoln if he really killed the vice president's brother. Lincoln insisted he had never killed anyone and was framed. Knowing his brother never lies, Michael shared his plan for today. Yes, Michael had painstakingly entered the prison to break out with his brother. Lincoln warned Michael not to take risks for him, as even if they got out, they would struggle without money. Michael didn't respond but just looked at Charles who was taking off his shoes. Lincoln added that even with money, they would need someone to help them live under new identities. They just don't know it yet. But escaping from such a high security level one prison was not as easy as just talking about it. Coincidentally, the prison had undergone renovations a few years ago, and the contracting company was Michael's employer. Therefore, Michael was very familiar with all the planning and structural diagrams of the prison, but how could he possibly know every corner of such a massive prison? That wasn't a problem for him. Two months before entering prison, he had all the route maps hidden in his tattoos. To most people, it might look like a common demonic tattoo, but if you stare at it for a few seconds, you'll realize that the tattoo actually hides a complex prison blueprint. And this was the key to Michael's escape plan. Knowing every part of the prison's structure, the next step was to acquire the tools needed for the escape. Michael took out a mirror reflecting a series of reversed English letters, which he copied onto a sheet of paper. During yard time, he sneakily explored something on a bench. When he found a bolt of a specific model, Michael finally stopped. He had investigated before entering prison and found that the material and diameter of this type of bolt were perfect for crafting into an essential tool for escape and these bolts were used on the benches in the yard. Michael pulled out a coin and calmly started his operation. Just then, the love-hated psychopathic killer teabag, accompanied by his cronies, approached head-on. Please, sit. It turned out Michael was sitting right in teabag's territory, but instead of telling Michael to get up, teabag looked at Michael with lust and told him, if you hold my pocket, I guarantee no one in this prison will dare to mess with you. Looks to me you already got a girlfriend. got a whole nother pocket over here. But Michael firmly rejected him, which completely infuriated Teabag. Teabag, with a dark expression, chased Michael away, leaving behind the partially twisted bolt that was exposed. The next day during yard time, Michael returned to the spot and successfully retrieved the bolt. However, Teabag, who was passing by, spotted him, 
Michael had no choice but to hand over the bolt to Teabag. When the guards arrived, Teabag pretended to stretch, surreptitiously passing a bolt to his crony, narrowly avoiding the guards' questioning. Meanwhile, a major racial clash was brewing in the prison between the black and white gangs, each waiting for an opportunity to strike a fatal blow. Teabag, as a member of the white gang, was actively preparing for battle. Michael seized this opportunity to sneak into Teabag's cell in search of the stolen bolt. Unfortunately, he was once again caught by Teabag who arrived suddenly. However, Michael reacted swiftly and approached Teabag without changing his expression. I want in. Their conversation was noticed by Benjamin from across the way. He had always thought Michael was neutral, which is why he agreed to help him get the medicine. Until Michael joined the white gang, Benjamin, with the medicine he had procured, lured Michael to a secluded corner, where several black inmates immediately surrounded him. Despite Michael's explanations, Benjamin refused to believe him. Since you've joined the enemy, you can forget about getting the medicine I got for you. you chose the wrong side. Now Michael was completely doomed. Not only did he not get the bolts, but he lost the medicine that was coming to him. The usually calm and collected Michael couldn't help but feel a surge of anger. Even the most perfect plan can be ruined by the most uncontrollable factor, people. Back in his cell, Michael pondered his next move when suddenly, a warning to count the inmates echoed from downstairs. At that moment, a white inmate walked out of the line against instructions. Michael knew this was the signal for the start of the racial war. As expected, the inmates surged forward and began fighting. Innocent Michael was thrown down the stairs in the chaos. During the turmoil, Teabag's crony rushed towards Michael. He had been annoyed by the handsome Michael for some time. Fearing his position in Teabag's heart was threatened, he picked up the bolt and stabbed viciously at Michael, but the smaller man was no match for Michael. Michael overpowered him and snatched the bolt back. Just as the crony prepared to attack again, a black inmate stood in front of him. The crony fell into Michael's arms, and this scene was once again witnessed by Teabag. Thinking it was Michael who had acted viciously, Teabag advanced, ready to kill him. Michael had no time to explain as he hurriedly escaped back to his cell amidst the smoke bombs released by the guards. Although he finally had the bolt in hand, he had now thoroughly offended Teabag. You got nowhere to run. You're trapped in that little hole of yours. Trapped like a big gun called slaughter. An origami crane, something even a primary school student could fold, became a tool for escape in Michael's hands. While the prison doctor wasn't looking, he placed the crane into the medical office's drain. The paper crane traveled downstream and soon reached the drainage ditch below the yard. This indicated that the drainage system connected the medical office to the prison yard. Michael also noticed a thick electrical cable outside the medical office, leading directly outside the prison, meaning the medical office was a necessary exit for the escape. Michael knew that he needed to maintain a good relationship with Sarah to get the key to the medical office and then remove the security window to escape. Thus, he visited her under the pretense of needing insulin injections for diabetes, casually chatting to build rapport. The problem was he didn't actually have diabetes, and the excessive insulin caused his hands to tremble. Arousing Sarah's suspicion, Michael approached Benjamin in the prison to get pills that counteracted insulin. Benjamin, realizing he had misunderstood Michael after learning of his feud with Teabag, returned the pills to Michael, and Michael finally passed Sarah's test. However, Escaping with his brother Lincoln from such a conspicuous place as the yard was not practical. He needed to create a passage from the cell to the medical office. When alone, Michael continuously ground down the bolt he had retrieved from the bench. Soon, the bolt was shaped into a hexagon. He rolled up his sleeve and compared the hexagonal bolt with the tattoo on his arm. The sizes matched almost perfectly. Michael inserted the bolt into the basin's plug hole and gently twisted it, successfully unscrewing it. The plan seemed perfect but making a hole large enough for a person to crawl through in the cell was a monumental task. Moreover, he had a cellmate named Sucre, and digging a hole under the same roof without Sucre noticing was impossible. The only option was to involve Sucre in the plan. But first, he needed to test Sucre's trustworthiness. To test Sucre, Michael hit a phone in plain sight of Sucre during a work detail and then had his brother Lincoln report that he saw someone hiding a phone, implying Sucre, you know. Possession of a mobile phone in prison can add up to two years to your sentence. Unexpectedly, although Sucre appeared simple-minded on the surface, he was very loyal in character. Despite the risk of being thrown into solitary confinement, 
he did not reveal that Michael was the owner of the phone. In return, Sucre let Michael lend him his mobile phone to call his girlfriend, but the phone was just soap with black paint on it. Feeling tricked, Sucre angrily confronted Michael about his intentions. Michael then revealed his escape plan, including the idea of bringing Sucre along. Sucre was furious. With less than 16 months left on his sentence, a loving girlfriend outside, and a bright future ahead, why would he want to escape with someone facing over 50 years? Not wanting to be involved but also unwilling to report Michael, Sucre requested a transfer to another cell. Meanwhile, John's former mafia associate visited the prison again, this time bringing John's children. He warned John for the last time that if he didn't find out where the witnesses were, his wife and children would be in bad shape before they came in. The threat left John restless, realizing that hard tactics wouldn't work on Michael and he needed to think of something else. On the other hand, Teabag has prepared an incredibly sharp serrated knife to avenge his cronies. Knowing Michael had a feud with Teabag, John lured Teabag to a room and beat him up in front of Michael. You and I need to have a conversation. From that moment, John officially joined Michael's escape plan. Rather than be threatened in prison forever, it was better to escape and deal with their enemies. He told Michael he would cover him in prison and get him anything he needed. But in return, Michael had to take him along in the escape. With this, Michael's path in prison became much easier. But unexpectedly, Captain Bellick brought a new cellmate for Michael, Charles who was transferred from a mental hospital due to lack of space. Charles used to be in a mental institution, but he was transferred here because he had no place to live. Now the problem was significant. Michael either had to include Charles in the plan or dig the hole only while Charles was asleep. But the world of a mentally ill person is unpredictable. Michael had to dig at night. One night, when everyone else was asleep, he quietly got up to dig. But when he turned around, he found Charles staring at him with penetrating eyes. What's your problem? I got a neuroanatomic lesion affecting my reticular activating system. What does that mean? It means I don't sleep at all. Michael felt utterly hopeless. Was this a torture sent by fate? Did Charles never sleep? The reason Prison Break is considered an eternal classic in American television history is not only because of its compact plot and tense storyline that makes it impossible to stop watching after just one episode, it is also because the difficulties Michael encounters are interlocked like gears, where a single misstep could lead to the complete failure of the escape plan. This time, Michael faces a challenge in the form of a new cellmate, Haywire, transferred from the psychiatric ward. Haywire possesses superior reasoning abilities, high intelligence, and an eidetic memory. But due to brain damage, he does not need to sleep at night. This means Michael cannot find an opportunity to dig a hole in their cell. The only solution is to bring Haywire on board. Michael tentatively asks Haywire if he has ever thought about leaving and what he would like to do outside. However, Haywire tells him that being mentally ill, it doesn't matter where he goes, he would still end up in a psychiatric hospital. This statement deeply discourages Michael. Despite being in a deadlock, Michael must find a way to escape because Lincoln has less than a month before his execution. Cuso represents copper sulfate, and PL represents phosphoric acid. Michael bribes a fellow inmate to steal a bottle of wall brick cleaner from the prison storeroom. During yard time, Michael obtains a type of chemical weed killer from John. Their chemical components are phosphoric acid and copper sulfate, respectively. He squeezes out haywires and his own toothpaste and fills the tubes with the two chemical agents. Then, he goes to Sarah's infirmary and pours the chemical agents down the drain. The combination of these chemicals produces a highly corrosive liquid, preparing the ground for the escape. However, this creates a small problem. Haywire keeps asking Michael where his toothpaste has gone. Michael can only respond that he doesn't know because Haywire keeps misplacing his things. Shocked, Haywire says, Are you treating me like I'm stupid? My things are always neatly arranged. Besides, in such a tiny place, where could I possibly misplace it? It seems Haywire is not truly foolish. Michael constantly seeks opportunities to evade Haywire's surveillance. Yet, Haywire, behaving almost obsessively, always appears behind Michael unexpectedly. Moreover, Haywire seems to have discovered the secret hidden in Michael's tattoos. There's a tattoo, it's a pattern. More alarmingly, Haywire, not sleeping in the middle of the night, starts to examine Michael's tattoos by tearing open his shirt. The tattoos, there's a maze. 
get away from me. Completely captivated by Michael's tattoos, Haywire becomes obsessed and starts drawing Michael's tattoos in his notebook during yard time. Michael is driven to the brink of insanity by Haywire. If he does not do something, the escape plan will inevitably be sabotaged by Haywire. At this moment, Sucre rushes to Michael, saying he has changed his mind and wants to escape with Michael. I'm back in. Too late. I'll do anything you need. You see these hands? The digging machine. You want to go to China? I'll get you to China fish. I'll, I'll dig like a psychotic rodent if I have to. Fish, I gotta be back in. A few days earlier, Sucre's cousin visited him in prison, revealing that Sucre's girlfriend, Mary Cruz, had started a relationship with him and they were about to get married. This infuriates Sucre, who immediately calls Mary Cruz for confirmation. Mary Cruz says she cannot wait any longer since she is almost 30 years old, and waiting for Sucre to be released after 16 months is too late. Hearing this, the love-struck Sucre cannot wait another moment, even if it means risking escape to win back his love. Michael is pleased to see Sucre's change of heart. Now, the urgent task is to get rid of Haywire. Upon returning to their cell, Michael is shocked to find that Haywire has managed to piece together the tattoos from memory, realizing the secret will soon be exposed. Michael does not hesitate to hit his head against the bars. Once not enough, then twice. When Haywire sees the blood on Michael's forehead, he immediately understands what has happened. Michael calls the guards, framing Haywire as having a violent tendency. Finally got this guy out of here. Not long after, Sucre moves back in excitedly. Now, they must focus on the task at hand. Sucre pulled out a mirror and saw that there were no guards around. So Michael removed the screws from the basin and prepared to dig a hole. Sucre, puzzled, asks how burning through the infirmary's pipes relates to their current location. Michael explains that breaking through this wall is just the beginning of the escape. There are many rooms between here and the prison wall, and the infirmary is the building closest to the wall, making it an essential exit point for the escape. They must create a path from here to the infirmary. Michael takes out a piece of paper to test the depth of the ash seam, which is nearly enough. He asks Sucre to make some noise, and Sucre, understanding immediately, begins his performance. It didn't take long for all of Sucre's family to be greeted by the inmates. Amidst the chaos of curses, Michael kicks the wall hard, finally creating a large hole big enough for a person to crawl through. The arrival of the guards quiets the prison, and Michael successfully crawls out of the cell. But this is only the first step of the escape plan. Michael still needs time to explore the escape route. However, the next day, after yard time, Michael returns to his cell only to find Pope waiting for him, a bad omen looming over him. Michael also notices the leaking screw hole. Fortunately, Pope does not discover anything unusual, but he delivers worse news to Michael. Pope says he received orders from above to transfer Michael to another prison, and it will be carried out tomorrow. It feels like the sky is falling for Michael, who pleads desperately with Pope not to do so, but Pope is unmoved, as he has no choice. I'm not the one behind the transfer. You're up against much bigger fish than me. At this point, it's necessary to mention a powerful force outside the prison. As Lincoln said, the vice president's brother was not killed by Lincoln, he was just a scapegoat. A mysterious organization deliberately forged the crime scene surveillance footage and killed anyone who could testify. In the process of eliminating obstacles, they accidentally discovered Lincoln has a brother named Michael, who was in the same prison for a robbery charge. Guessing what Michael intends to do, they immediately call a woman. Clearly, this woman is the mastermind behind the scenes. She orders her subordinates to find Pope and threatens him with the death of his illegitimate son, forcing him to transfer Michael to another prison. Although Pope owes Michael, his family is his priority, so he has to comply. But Michael does not give up. He finds Charles. The experienced Charles says it's quite easy. You just need to write an application claiming some part of your body is uncomfortable. The rejection of the application takes at least a month's process. And during this month, no one has the authority to touch you. Michael immediately does so, and Pope has to admit he has learned a lot here. Since the process is legitimate and regulation compliant, Pope smiles and tacitly agrees. Michael restarts the escape plan. He has Sucre pretend to hang clothes as a cover while he searches for the path to the infirmary through the structural gaps in the cell. But Michael finds a wall blocking the way. Moreover, with the roll calls happening periodically, he has no time to dig through this wall. Sucre thinks of a method, only when the cell block is on lockdown do the guards leave. And there's no roll call. 
giving them enough time to dig through the wall. The question is, how can they incite the prisoners to cause enough trouble to initiate a lockdown? To create chaos for the escape, Michael crawls into a pre-dug hole in the cell and then makes his way through the pipes to the air conditioning room. Not only does he turn off the air conditioning, but he also turns on the heat. In the scorching summer, the prisoners cannot stand the sound-like conditions of their cells. Led by Teabag, the prisoners start a riot, declaring they won't go back without cool air. The prisoners join in the uproar. The guards, seeing the enraged crowd, announce they will put them all in solitary confinement while fearfully retreating from the cell block. However, in their panic, the guards forget to lock the prisoners in their cells. Captain Bellick tries to intimidate the scene but is mocked by Teabag, who says only those who fail to become policemen end up as prison guards. Bellick retorts by exposing Teabag's scars. I read your psych records about how your daddy raped his mongoloid sister and then nine months later, little Teddy pops out. Unable to bear the insult, Teabag leads the prisoners in violently shaking the metal doors. Seeing the security doors starting to give way, Bellic quickly leaves with the guards. Soon, the first prison gate is breached. Teabag finds a set of keys in the control room, meaning all the prisoners inside can move freely. They search everywhere inside for a way out. Bellic, knowing the situation was dire, wanted to charge in and take them down. But with the prison full of desperados, how many could his bullets actually kill? Left with no choice, Bellic reports to his superiors and requests backup. The infirmary is in a separate area from the cell blocks. Hearing that freedom has been achieved on the other side, the prisoners being treated in the infirmary, happy and dancing, also start a riot. They kill the guards and attempt to assault Sarah. Seeing the situation turning dire, Sarah quickly hides in a room. She blocks the door with a table and tries to call for help. But the phone lines have already been cut by the prisoners. A man desperately bangs on the door and another reaches his hand in, only to be knocked out by Sarah with a tranquilizer. The news of the riot at Fox River State Penitentiary not only reaches the media but also Governor Frank, who is Sarah's father, he urgently sends a SWAT team to the prison. On the other side, Michael and Sucre, taking advantage of the prison riot, are diligently working in the structural gaps to break through the wall. Would you believe that a small egg beater can bring down a 50 centimeter thick concrete wall? Let's see how Michael accomplishes this. He takes out a lamp and places it 2 meters from the wall, then makes a simple lampshade out of aluminum foil to focus the light. Next, he sticks a piece of paper with a devil's pattern on the lampshade. In the next second, the devil's pattern appears on the load-bearing wall. Sucre doesn't understand what Michael is doing and how it's related to breaking through the wall to escape. Michael calmly explains, we just need to drill a few small holes at the top. This is the famous Hooke's Law. Simply put, when we try to break an object, it usually breaks in a straight line. Now, we just need to drill holes at several key points, which will compromise the wall's load-bearing capacity. Not understanding but no longer questioning, Sucre, somewhat skeptically, picks up the egg beater to start drilling. They are trying to create a path from the cell to the infirmary in preparation for the escape, but they could never have anticipated an accident that would completely disrupt their plans. Due to the prison riot, Teabag captures a guard and decides to take this opportunity to vent his frustrations. Under Teabag's violent beating, the guard crawls away to hide, but Teabag catches him, Bob, and throws him hard, causing him to crash into the sink in Michael's room. This leaves Teabag completely stunned. No wonder Michael has been acting so sneaky. He's been planning an escape, and this scene is witnessed by Bob. Just as Teabag is about to call for other guards, John covers his mouth and stops him. Hearing the noise, Michael also crawls out from a hole. Yeah, we, we have a problem. Uh now, the problem arises. Teabag is serving a life sentence and could potentially be convinced to join their cause. But what about Bob, the guard? We gotta kill him. The cops are right outside. And they'll stay outside. See, Bob here knows about our secret. He knows about our escape. So it's all of our concern now, isn't it? Meanwhile, several prisoners are furiously smashing the bulletproof glass of the infirmary. Decades of prison life have made them covet Sarah. Seeing the door about to be broken down, Sarah picks up a piece of glass, 
Ready to fight to the death, Michael sees this scene from the prison's control room. After instructing that Bob must not be harmed, he quickly crawls through the duct to save Sarah, while John and Sucre take advantage of the riot to return and continue drilling through the wall to prevent Teabag from harming Bob. John assigns someone to watch him, as Bob is the only bargaining chip that prevents the SWAT team from storming in. Soon after, Michael finally reaches Sarah's room. They crawl through the ventilation duct and find a safe spot to climb down. Just as Michael is about to get Sarah out of the prison, unexpectedly, a red dot appears on them. If Sarah moves even a step, Michael is undoubtedly dead, and if Michael doesn't leave, he will eventually be shot in the head. At the critical moment of the standoff, some prisoners rush in. Go! Michael, lying on the ground, successfully dodges a strike, and the other prisoners scatter. Michael takes the opportunity to escape back to the cell block, seeing his daughter Sarah safe. Frank no longer has any reservations, although there is still a guard inside. Frank doesn't care, he immediately orders a storming of the prison. <laughs> Meanwhile, Sucre and the others have drilled all the small holes according to Michael's instructions. Now it's time to see if Hook's law holds true. They return to the cell block to tell Michael this exhilarating news, but Teabag is determined to kill Bob because he is serving a life sentence and can never be paroled. So, the hole is his only hope of escaping. Despite the other's repeated attempts to dissuade and warn Teabag, he still takes advantage of the chaos to stab Bob to death. This is considered the most inhumane death penalty tool in the world, and Lincoln is about to face this punishment. Six or seven people strap Lincoln into the electric chair, securing his limbs and neck with belts, pour cold water on him to enhance conductivity, and place a metal helmet on his head. Typically, when a 50,000 volt current runs through his body, his fingers and toes severely bend, and his eyeballs sometimes burst out, sticking to his cheeks. The skin in contact with the electrodes is burnt to a crisp, even smoking which is why a black cloth is used to cover the face. Luckily, this is just a dream for Lincoln, but he is scheduled to face this execution in 17 days. Despite being innocent and framed, to save his brother, Michael ruined his career by going to prison and trying to escape with him. After three weeks, he finally breaks through the structural gaps and drainage pipes, allowing direct access from his cell to the infirmary. However, since Lincoln is a high-security prisoner and isolated, Michael can't get to his cell directly. Michael has studied the prison blueprints, where the steam and drainage pipes intersect under a storage room. If they can make a hole in the storage room, Michael and other members can meet in the infirmary. However, John reminds Michael that area is off-limits, never assigned for work unless there's a fire needing repair. They plan to burn the area with flammable materials. But as they prepare to open the door, they're greeted by the dark barrel of a gun. The area had been turned into a guard's restroom, putting their escape plan in a deadlock. When they are at a loss, they discover Charles can freely enter the area. Lincoln explains that Charles has a 32-year clean record, so the guards trust him. Which means we've got to get him on board. We got a guy's a boy scout. But Michael decided to give it a try anyway. No matter how much Michael coaxed or pleaded, Charles steadfastly refused to admit he had hidden one dollar, five million, nor would he join Michael in the escape, let alone help him with anything illegal. However, just as Charles returned to his cell, Bellick found him. It turned out that Bob, who was killed by Teabag during the riot, had his body fall right at Charles's cell door. Bellick wanted to get some clues from him, but Charles knew well the rules of this place. Whoever snitched would be despised by everyone. No matter how mournfully Bellick begged, Charles politely refused him. Unexpectedly, not having obtained any clues, Bellick immediately changed his tone. And before leaving, he did not forget to tease Charles's cat. However, the next day when Charles returned from the yard, he was shocked to find the cat motionless on the bed, its body already stiff. Charles was in immense pain. This cat was his only emotional support in prison. It was obvious to anyone that Bellick was the murderer of the cat. For the first time, Charles showed a fierce look in his eyes. He went to the guard's restroom and placed a coffee pot coated with rubber adhesive on the power source. Then Charles opened Bellick's locker and pulled out a Lucky Strike cigarette. Looking at the ugly face on the wall, 
Charles finally made up his mind and lit the lighter. Soon, thick smoke billowed out of the restroom. Happiness came so unexpectedly, leaving Michael and the others completely dumbfounded. Just then, Charles walked past Michael, but Charles made it clear that he did not do it for them, nor did he plan to join their escape team. After the fire was extinguished, investigators found a cigarette but at the scene. Bellic. Inside Fox River State Penitentiary, if you're holding onto Teabag's pocket, he can ensure no one dares to bully you. Not long ago, Teabag took a liking to the newly imprisoned Michael, lecherously expressing his desire to protect Michael. Yet, he was brutally rejected by Michael. To me, you already got a girlfriend. I got a whole nother pocket over here. I'll pass. A few days later, Teabag's sidekick was killed during a prison riot. To find a new sidekick for Teabag, Troki meticulously searched until he found a new toy for him, Seth. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> Why do you say we go for a walk, huh? Under Teabag's lascivious tyranny, Seth, despite his unwillingness, had no choice but to submit. Because Teabag killed a guard, Bellic, during the riot, Bellic swore to leave no stone unturned in finding the murderer. The next day, Seth approached Bellic to inform him that he knew who the killer was. I know who killed Bob, sir. A group of guards, with a menacing air, came to make an arrest. Sure enough, they found a photo of the murdered guard's family under the mattress, with the evidence and testimony at hand. There was nothing more to say. The guards directly arrested Troki. It turned out that this is teabag naked planted evidence. He knew that if he did not find someone to take the blame, he would one day be found out. Poor Troki, who had just found a new companion for teabag the day before, was betrayed by teabag today. Teabag is really a man of love and loyalty. Although Michael was very reluctant to let Teabag join the escape team, he had to accept him since Teabag knew his secret. The group successfully reached the burnt-down break room, and what they needed to do next was to break the floor to create an entrance big enough for a person to crawl through. Preparing for the upcoming escape, in the following days, they began smashing the floor covered with a blanket, with someone specially arranged to keep watch outside. The crushed stone dust produced was divided among everyone, with each finding opportunities to dispose of it. However, their traces were discovered by Benjamin, who, at that time, still had no idea what they were up to. What's worse, the shameless Bellic suddenly approached John. It turned out that John had been in charge of PI because his company outside was regularly paying Bellic every month. But this month, the payment had not arrived on time. Bellic threatened that if he didn't receive the money, he would hand over PI to someone else to manage. John made a call only to find out that the company was on the verge of bankruptcy. This was a complete disaster. If anyone else entered the break room, the entrance would be blatantly exposed. As they were all in a state of panic, Seth approached Michael, asking for his help. He could no longer endure Teabag's humiliation and torment. But Michael, with no time to spare for these matters, flatly refused Seth. However, not long after, Seth committed suicide. Guilt overwhelmed Michael's heart, and he silently vowed to deal with Teabag properly. Meanwhile, Bellic had already handed over P.I. to John's former subordinate, Gus, to manage. They, equipped with tools, marched towards the break room, watching Gus lead the newcomers into the rest area. John was frantic because the escape plan would be completely exposed as soon as they lifted the carpet. John hurried to find Gus, hoping the latter would relinquish control of P.I., but times had changed, and John's former underlings had all turned their backs on him, standing by Gus's side instead. You're yesterday's nose, John. As these people moved in and out day by day, Michael and his team were increasingly anxious to regain management of the PI. They need to keep John's outside partner, Philly, paying for him, and continuing to pay for John is contingent on the location of that key witness. This witness was the only person who could pique Philly's interest. After all, if the witness successfully testified next month, Philly would also end up in prison. Having no other choice, Michael decided to talk to Philly in person to gain Philly's trust. Michael detailed the entire process of locating the key witness. Before being moved for protection, the witness would be guarded by the local sheriff. There were four sheriffs in total in the area. Before entering prison, Michael had called around, finding three sheriffs in their offices. While the fourth was on vacation alone, without his family, it was clear that this sheriff was guarding the witness. 
since it would take several weeks for the police to establish a new identity for the witness. This sheriff would inevitably make a call home. Through his phone bills, Michael finally traced the witness's location. After explaining, Michael demanded $200,000 in exchange. Philly agreed without hesitation. For Philly, even $2 million was worth it if it meant avoiding prison, but when Philly traveled miles to the location Michael provided, a sudden flash of light and the police lying in ambush quickly apprehended them. <laughs> It turned out that the address Michael had given was fake. The witness, Fibonacci, was a good person, originally just a warehouse manager in John's company. One day, Fibonacci accidentally witnessed John committing murder and decided to step forward to report them. Of course, Michael couldn't possibly reveal Fibonacci's real whereabouts. After resolving the situation, John tentatively mentioned, Give me Fibonacci once we're outside these walls, right? Of course. Regardless, the money was secured, and naturally, John regained control of P.I., and everyone could work in the room again. Now that the hardest part had been breached, only 18 inches remained to reach the tunnel. According to the current progress, they could escape by Friday. Everyone was exceptionally excited, eagerly imagining life after their escape. However, just then, Bellick walked in with Benjamin. It turned out that not long ago, Benjamin had noticed Michael and the others sneakily disposing of broken stones. So he bribed Fiorello to investigate. That's how he discovered Michael and their astonishing secret. Standing over the hole, Benjamin threatened. Are you sure you can't use the extra hand? You know anything about construction? Concrete is my specialty. Can you dig it? Okay, boss. Sign him up. You got it. That looks like Darwin wins after all, eh, fish? Sucre whipped out a mirror. Checking that the coast was clear outside the prison, Michael then retrieved a credit card from a hidden layer in his prison uniform. Sucre, puzzled, asked, what's the use of hiding a credit card? It's not like you can go shopping in here. But in the next second, Michael peeled off the protective film from the credit card. It turned out to be a prison access card. Before getting locked up, Michael had already researched the access control systems of Fox River State Penitentiary. He then programmed the access credentials onto a magnetic strip and covered it with the sticker of a credit card. This way, even if the guards discovered it during a body search, it wouldn't jeopardize his escape plan. The reason he needed to create an access card was to sneak into the inmate's property storage room to retrieve two crucial items he had stored before getting incarcerated, a mini tape recorder and a gold watch. After regaining his belongings, Michael snuck into the drainage pipes, but as he inventoried his items, he realized the gold watch had vanished. This watch was a critical component of his escape plan. Michael learned from Charles that the guards often stole from inmates. The only time inmates would realize something was missing was when they were released and went to collect their belongings by then. It would be too late. Even more infuriating was that the thief was none other than Deputy Warden Roy, who wasn't shy about flaunting the watch for all to see. However, Michael couldn't accuse Roy directly because he couldn't explain how he knew the watch was stolen. The only solution was to find someone to steal the watch back. That's when David approached him, sentenced to five years for theft. David was eager to join the PI crew. It just so happens that Michael is also in need of David. So the two of them hit it off. Michael would help David get into PI. And in return, David would retrieve the gold watch. The very next day the infirmary wheeled in a vomiting young man who was none other than David. It was clear David's skills were top-notch. One second the watch was on Roy's wrist. And the next, it was gone, with Roy none the wiser. Soon after, David had Charles deliver the watch to Michael. However, Charles had a favor to ask of Michael. I want in. Michael was puzzled. Charles had always declined his invitations before. So why the sudden change of heart? It turned out that earlier that morning, Pope had somberly informed Charles in his office that his daughter had been diagnosed with late-stage esophageal cancer and was hospitalized. Unlikely to last another week, the authorities had denied their request, only permitting Charles to attend his daughter's funeral. Pope's words hit Charles like a bolt from the blue. His daughter was his only concern in the world. Determined to see his daughter one last time, Charles decided to join the escape plan, but Michael was in a difficult position. Every member of the escape team had to be useful, and he had made it clear that there was no hidden stash of one dollar. Five million. Moreover, Charles's age would undoubtedly slow them down. But the next day, Charles approached Michael again, handing him a Bible. 
DI-192589, the first number in the series of bills used in the ransom drop. Inside was a $100 bill, the serial number of which matched the sequence Charles had mentioned before. It seemed Charles did have a significant amount of money hidden away, realizing that they would be stranded without funds after the escape. Michael agreed to his request. Thus, the escape team now consisted of seven members. However, a subsequent event made Michael realize that the group was severely over capacity. They had to cut someone to succeed in their escape. But who would that person be? Even a small button, in Michael's hands, could serve an unexpected purpose. He dropped the button down the slope of the drain pipe. Listening to the sound of the button bouncing, he estimated that the reservoir below the slope was only 1, 13, 14 meters away. This meant that even if he slid down, he wouldn't break his legs. Looking up, he saw the manhole 4, 5 meters above him, surrounded by absolutely no footholds. Escaping through here seemed like a pipe dream, yet it was the only way out. Michael had to find even the slightest chance. Suddenly, he spotted a semicircular drain outlet. Peeling open a hidden layer of his clothing, Michael pulled out a rope and a black plastic bag. He packed his clothes into the plastic bag, tied it closed with the rope, and then used the bag to block the outflow pipe of the reservoir. Next, all Michael had to do was turn on the water valve to use the buoyancy of the water to lift himself up. However, the main valve outside was shut off, making it impossible to release any water. The following day, while working in PI, Michael used a stick to pry open the disc of the main valve. Moments later, water finally gushed out. He set the water release time for three and a half minutes, and the water level in the reservoir began to rise gradually. Just then, a guard approached, and Charles quickly coughed to catch Michael's attention. The guard whistled, ordering the inmates back to their cells. Luckily, the timer hit zero just in time, and Michael quickly returned the valve to its original state. By then, the water level was just half a person's height from the manhole cover. After returning to his cell, Michael immediately crawled through the pre-dug hole into the drainage pipe, then stripped and entered the water-filled reservoir. He grabbed the other end of the rope and, using the buoyancy of the water, successfully rose to the surface. Michael's calculations of the reservoir's size and the pipe diameter were incredibly accurate. Any longer, and the overflowing water might have been discovered by the guards. Any shorter, and he would never have reached the manhole cover. Michael lifted the manhole cover to arrive beneath the infirmary's pharmacy, where his own folded lead paper lay on the ground. Just days before, Michael had obtained weed killer and tile cleaner from the sewer, whose chemical reaction produced sulfuric acid, successfully corroding the iron sheet of the infirmary's sewer. The paper crane naturally landed on the ground, tightening the rope. Michael pulled hard, reopening the reservoir's drain. He then tied the rope to the manhole cover, which would serve as a bridge for the escape team to enter the pharmacy tonight. Michael gently peeled back the iron sheet to clearly observe the situation inside the infirmary. Everything was ready, and Michael prepared to climb out from the rest area through the drainage pipe. The others in the lounge also successfully dug through the tunnel. But just then, Roy came over to inspect the area, hearing the noise. The inmates had to quickly cover the opening, trapping Michael in the drainage pipe. If the guards discovered one person missing now, the escape plan could be completely exposed. To buy time for those inside, Lincoln had no choice but to punch Roy. Hearing the commotion, other guards quickly subdued Lincoln, while the inmates managed to pull Michael up. Michael jubilantly informed everyone that the way was clear and they could escape tonight. However, the others couldn't share in his joy. Lincoln's assault on a guard meant he would be put in solitary confinement, and his execution was scheduled for the next day. On the other side, Teabag had slashed John's throat, and Sarah was rushing him to a helicopter for emergency treatment. Whether John could survive was still unknown. Teabag acted as if nothing had happened. The problem was, their escape plan relied on John's plane to leave the country. With that link broken, even if they managed to escape, they wouldn't get far. Michael fell into despair. He had gone through great lengths to get into prison solely to save his brother, Lincoln. If Lincoln couldn't escape, then what was the point of this long planned escape? Michael is sterilizing a razor blade with a lighter before rolling up his sleeves to reveal the demon tattoo on his arm. He locates the spot and, bracing himself against the severe pain, slices open his arm. Soon after, a black pill wrapped in resin cotton appears before his eyes. This was Michael's contingency plan before he went to prison. His brother Lincoln is scheduled for execution tomorrow. Michael must use this tiny pill to save his brother's life and help him escape from prison successfully. Michael knows only a priest can visit his brother who's in solitary confinement. So, he lies, 
claiming this necklace is of significant importance to his brother, insisting it must be personally handed to Lincoln. The priest agrees to Michael's request. When Lincoln receives the necklace, he knows his brother would never let him die innocently. He examines the necklace closely, he pries open the crucifix to find the small pill hidden in a groove, along with a note tucked inside. Eat this precisely at 8.10 tonight. It's now 4 in the afternoon. Time to head to P.I., Prison Industries, Work. Michael and Sucre embrace each other. Their success in escaping prison hinges on this very moment. The escape team, five in total, tries to keep calm as they head to the break room. During their work in the break room, Michael announces the escape plan. Tonight at 9, they'll crawl through the tunnel they've dug to the infirmary, where Lincoln will meet them. Then they'll break the security window and climb out along the infirmary's external cables over the wall. Once outside, they're on their own. Be forgetting the fact that P.I. shuts down at 5 o'clock, pretty. And we have to make sure it doesn't, don't we? Michael is prepared. He removes a plasterboard from the wall to reveal a water pipe and smashes it with a hammer. Oh, what the hell are you doing, man? Upon receiving the news, Bellic storms in furiously. The men, soaked to the skin, sit on the ground like children who've been caught misbehaving. Michael explains they accidentally broke a pipe while renovating. If they don't dry the walls and floor quickly, the plasterboard will absorb water and mold. Bellic, even angrier, snaps. Then what are you sitting around for? If you don't get rid of every drop of water, nobody's sleeping tonight. Don't catch a sniffle. Seeing their plan succeed, everyone bursts into laughter, but Michael can't seem to share their joy, for it's still uncertain whether Lincoln can join them successfully. At 8.10 p.m., Lincoln takes the pill on time, and within seconds, he's in agonizing pain, vomiting and suffering from diarrhea. The guards rush to take Lincoln to the infirmary for emergency treatment. Finally, at 9 o'clock, the group lifts the carpet and uses a wrench to lock the door from the inside. Everything is ready, and they excitedly wait for Michael to give the order. See you on the other side. They climb down the hole, through the drainage pipe, slide down the slope to the reservoir below, and, using a rope they had prepared earlier, successfully reach the pharmacy below the infirmary. But as Michael looks up at the drainage pipe on the roof, his smile freezes. The pipe he had corroded was replaced with a brand new one, thicker than before. It turns out that a cleaner, while collecting trash that afternoon, accidentally saw the corroded pipe and called maintenance to replace it. Michael and Sucre exert all their strength but can't budge the heavy-duty pipe, meaning this route is completely blocked. Michael can clearly hear Lincoln above, trying to smash the pipe with a mop. Such a thick pipe could probably only be dug through with an excavator. The last time the brothers might see each other could only be at the execution ground tomorrow. The man slipped a packet of rat poison into his pocket. Then Michael had his fellow inmates keep watch while he moved the prison's wash basin aside and crawled through a hole that had already been dug out behind it. Michael sprinkled the rat poison on the ground of the drainage pipe. And in no time, a rat fell for the bait. Michael grabbed the rat by its tail. Tonight. Lincoln is scheduled to be executed in the electric chair. Whether his brother's life can be saved all depends on whether this rat has the cunning needed to save his brother, who had been framed and wrongfully accused. Michael did not hesitate to ruin his own future by getting himself imprisoned. It took Michael over a month to find a way out of prison, but, as fate would have it, they discovered last night during their escape attempt that the exit had been inadvertently sealed shut by maintenance workers. The escape team had no choice but to trudge back to their cells in defeat. The next day, during yard time, Michael found Charles. Charles mentioned something that happened about 10 years ago. A man was supposed to be executed by electric chair, but he survived because a fuse blew. And it took another three weeks to reschedule the execution because killing a person requires going through many procedures, such as issuing a new death warrant and death certificate. Charles's words reignited hope in Michael's heart. Three weeks was enough time for him to plan another escape. Thus, Michael came up with the idea to use the rat to sabotage the wiring, but he could never have anticipated that David would spoil his plans. A few days ago, David had helped Michael retrieve a gold watch, but as part of the exchange, Michael did not get him into P.I., which left David harboring resentment. Bellic had long suspected Michael was up to something but had been unable to find proof. So, Bellic paid off David to watch Michael's every move. David overheard Michael mentioning something about a problem with the electric chair and saying his brother could live another three weeks. This made Bellic suspicious. Immediately, Bellic went to the execution room to have his men retest the electric chair for faults. 
it ain't working. Well, son of a bitch. I don't know what could have happened. They rushed to the electrical room and indeed found a dead rat in the fuse box. Bellick's intention was clear. He wanted Lincoln to die smoothly. So, Bellick had the electrician repair the wiring and then hurry to Michael's cell. Schofield, your brother's gonna be transported to final visitation soon. You can meet him there. You look surprised. You knew it was scheduled today. The two brothers embraced tightly upon seeing each other. Despite all the well-laid plans, Michael was ultimately unable to save his brother's life. Michael still planned to look for another way, but Lincoln had already calmly accepted his fate and didn't want to struggle in vain any longer. Perhaps this was his destiny. In his last six hours, all he wanted to do was talk to his brother and enjoy their last peaceful moments together. As the time for the execution approached and Lincoln was walking to the death chamber, Pope suddenly received a call from Frank. Warden. What is it? It's the governor. It turned out that earlier that day, while Michael was at the infirmary getting an injection, he told Sarah the truth about his brother being framed and asked if Sarah could plead with her father for a pardon. The many interactions had made Sarah develop feelings for Michael. Sarah found Veronica, the lawyer in charge of the case, and handed over all the evidence they had collected to her father. However, Frank's call wasn't to grant a reprieve but to ensure the execution went smoothly. He's not granting clemency. Let's proceed. After hanging up, a mysterious woman approached Frank from behind. You did your country and your party a great service. It won't go unnoticed. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Thank you, Governor. It was revealed that the person so determined to see Lincoln dead was none other than the Vice President, Caroline. Frank was also looking to gain political capital. The innocence of a small fry meant nothing to him. Yet! Why would someone like Caroline go to such lengths to have him killed? What unspeakable secrets were hidden behind all this? Simply amused by the gods in the comments section, how is Prison Break updated to over a dozen episodes, each seemingly heart-stopping? Yet in the end, Michael's escape plan hasn't progressed in the slightest. After painstakingly digging for over a month, just when a glimmer of hope was seen, a small, unintended act by the maintenance staff completely sealed it off. This is precisely the brilliance of Prison Break. Just by looking at the title, you already know the outcome. Yet the screenwriters managed to fill 22 episodes with unceasing suspense and not a single flaw. This is the fundamental reason why Prison Break is legendary. Due to the failure of the escape plan, Michael's brother Lincoln was still unable to escape the fate of being executed. But at the critical moment of switching on the power, Lincoln seemed to spot a face in the family area, both incredibly familiar and strange. Then, suddenly, alarms went off and the curtain was slowly drawn. What's going on? I don't know. Before Michael can figure out what's going on, Pope walks out with Lincoln, whose legs are weak with fear. What happened in there? Judge Kessler called. The execution's been delayed. What do you mean delayed? Apparently some new evidence has come to light. What evidence? I don't understand. How long do we have? One day? Two days? It's all the information I have at the moment. I'm sorry. Before this information could be digested, his brother told Michael another unbelievable thing. It was dad. It was dad. Lincoln said he saw their father. How could Michael believe that? Since their father had abandoned them 30 years ago, how could he possibly appear in the last minute of Lincoln's execution? And what power did he have to stop the execution? Lincoln's lawyer, Veronica found the judge. Only then did they learn that the judge had received an anonymous letter before the execution, containing an autopsy report of Caroline's brother. The report clearly stated that the deceased had an appendix. However, Caroline's brother's record showed he had an appendectomy as a child, meaning the body sent for autopsy wasn't Caroline's brother. While it couldn't prove Lincoln was innocent, it at least pointed to a huge conspiracy. On the other hand, when Caroline learned Lincoln hadn't died, she was frantic. She immediately ordered Paul and Samantha to investigate who had sent the anonymous letter to the judge. Although the whistleblower was extremely careful, Samantha still saw his face reflected in the glass. The man was none other than Lincoln's father, who had appeared in the execution viewing area. From Samantha's shocked expression, it was clear she recognized him. And he was an old adversary. What story lies behind them? I know that guy. 
Michael wasn't just sitting around, he planned to use the limited time to escape with his brother, the previous escape route was obviously no longer viable, he gathered the escape team and announced a new round of escape plans, the psychiatric ward of the prison is the only building that shares an underground passage with the medical ward, now, they could only go from the guard's rest area through a well in the yard, then walk about 50 meters underground to reach the psychiatric ward, and from there take the sewer of the psychiatric ward to the medical ward. This presents a small problem, there's no cover above this well in the yard, and there are three watchtowers monitoring the area. Benjamin remarked that this plan was tantamount to suicide, but only Michael knew this was the only way out, to quickly scout the route. Sucre was also anxious. At this moment, he spotted a familiar figure passing by. It was his cousin Monch. Monch's main job was to do laundry for the guards and inmates. An idea struck Sucre. He planned to borrow a guard's uniform from Monch. This way, Michael wouldn't be so conspicuous when he climbed out of the well. In the wee hours, Michael was ready to act. Before entering the prison, he had researched that the psychiatric ward of the prison was built in 1858. Afterward, the underground pipes underwent three major renovations, so the network of pipes was complex, and no one could remember it. To avoid getting lost, Michael had the blueprints of the pipes tattooed on his back. If he took the wrong turn tonight, he might not be able to return in time for roll call. Michael, dressed in the guard's uniform, climbed out of the well, but at that moment, a bright light suddenly shone on him, and Michael acted calm. Fortunately, wearing the guard's uniform, he managed to bluff his way through. He went to the psychiatric ward, an area most guards were reluctant to visit, claiming he needed to use the bathroom. Michael found his way to the abandoned storage room and finally located the manhole cover that led to the medical ward. But while retracing his steps after surveying the route, he suddenly encountered a patrolling guard in the boiler room. Michael hid in the corner, not daring to breathe, enduring the intense pain of his back pressed against the scalding hot water pipe. After the guard left, Michael, enduring the pain, crawled back to his room. To avoid being discovered by the checking guard, he asked Sucre to quickly strip off the uniform, but the uniform had already stuck to his skin, and the intense pain made Michael involuntarily cry out. This noise alerted the guard, and Pope questioned Sucre about why he burned his fellow inmate. Sucre had no choice but to bite the bullet and ended up in solitary confinement for a day. Unexpectedly, Sarah was very concerned about Michael. Although Michael wouldn't tell her what happened, Sarah found fibers from the skin that were clearly from a guard's uniform. This made Sarah suspicious of Michael. But worse, when Michael returned to his room and unwrapped the bandages, he was completely dumbfounded. The burn was exactly where the map of the underground pipes of the psychiatric ward was located. This meant without these maps, they couldn't escape. The escape plan was once again in dire straits. Sister, the your blue as the shown. They aren't showing, baby, they're flying. Teabag could never have imagined that Fox River State Penitentiary would house such a beauty. Blonde hair, red lips, and eyes like autumn waters constantly tugged at his heartstrings. But what fascinated Teabag even more was his bright red underwear turned inside out. It was this pair of underwear that would save the escape team a total of 50 years of imprisonment. Just yesterday afternoon, while resting during labor, the escape quintet was preparing to dig a tunnel for their future escape. But then, Charles, who was on lookout outside, suddenly came and saying the guards were about to arrive. Everyone hurriedly covered the hole and then placed a carpet over it, narrowly avoiding disaster. However, a comment from the guard left everyone feeling cold. It turns out Bellic thought they were working too slowly and planned to have a professional renovation team take over their work the next day. Right after the guard left, the escape team was in an uproar. Because once the renovation team came in and lifted the carpet, their escape plan would be completely exposed. Michael, calm in the face of danger, instructed everyone to block the hole with plywood and then smooth it over with quick dry cement. They could break it open with a sledgehammer when it was time to escape. But misfortune never comes singly, just as they were about to start. Roy suddenly came in to inform Michael that Pope wanted to see him in his office, leaving the rest to do other tasks in the yard. Everyone was instantly stunned. They simply didn't have time to fix the hole. Moreover, labor time was about to end. And if the renovation team came in the next morning, it would be over, taking advantage of the limited time. The four discussed letting Sucre go into the cell block that night to block the hole. But Sucre was not unwilling. If he went into the restroom to block the hole, he would be trapped in that room. And if he tried to go out through the main door and walk on the ground, he would definitely be caught by the guards, which was essentially asking to be captured. That's 10 years on my bed if I get caught. You better figure out a way not to get caught. Line it up. 
After dinner, Michael still hadn't returned from Pope's office. Just as Sucre was at his wit's end, he suddenly spotted a very sexy inmate passing by, especially his red underwear turned inside out, which was incredibly eye-catching. An idea struck Sucre immediately. He found Teabag and asked him to use his skills to get the flamboyant man's underwear. I mean, you know what you're asking of me? You gotta do it for the team. Sister, they are blue as the show. They aren't showing, baby, they're flying. Mm -hmm. Probably. <laughs> it has to be said, Teabag truly had a way with things. In just a few minutes, he delivered the prize to Sucre's hands. In the early hours, Sucre set into motion. He crawled through the drainage pipe into the restroom via the hole Michael had already dug behind the sink. After a set of skilled masonry work, Sucre finally fixed the hole, then sneakily made his way back to the prison cell. But as he ran towards the yard, a strong light shone on him, and as expected, the guards immediately caught Sucre. If I were you, I'd better start talking, Mano. However, Sucre was prepared. He claimed that after yard time ended today, he had been hiding in a corner of the yard, all to wait for his girlfriend outside the prison to throw something in. Runs. Sucre explained pitifully that he missed his girlfriend so much that he had her send over one of her personal items, all for that damn love. Bellic, being a man of sorrow himself because his love for Sarah was unrequited, sympathized with those loyal to love. Bellic did not make it hard for Sucre. He just sniffed the underwear and then locked Sucre up in solitary confinement. What Sucre didn't know was that the solitary cell next to him was housing Michael. The reason the Pope called Michael into his office was because the night before, Michael had gotten a guard uniform to use to explore escape routes. However, Michael accidentally burned both the back of the uniform and his skin, and Sarah discovered the fibers of the uniform embedded in his skin while treating him. Pope thought a guard had abused Michael and demanded Michael explain himself. Otherwise, he would be put in solitary confinement. But Michael would never reveal the truth to Pope which led to him being locked up in solitary. With the map of the pipe network on his back damaged by the burn, Michael felt as if he had lost his soul, continuously punching the wall with his fists. When the guards noticed, they immediately notified Sarah to come for an examination. At that time, Michael's eyes were wide open, as if he had gone insane. With no other choice, Pope had to transfer him to the psychiatric ward for care. However, as soon as the guards and the doctor left, Michael became a different person, he had faked his illness precisely to find someone he knew in the psychiatric ward. Someone who had been his roommate for a few days Haywire. Haywire had once memorized the tattoos on Michael's body. As long as Haywire could piece together the missing parts from memory, the escape plan could be put back into action. But what Michael never expected was that Haywire had already forgotten who Michael was. Who are you? Due to Sucre being locked up in solitary confinement and Michael being sent to the psychiatric ward, their cell was left vacant. Roy, spotting an opportunity, thought this room, facing north with superior lighting and situated on a middle floor, could be considered a prime cell in the prison. Surely, inmates would be willing to pay for a room swap. As expected, during yard time, the inmates who came to view the room were endless, with some even bidding up to $200 for it. However, when noticing a slight leak from the sink, an inmate stated he would only pay after it was fixed. Roy promised to get it fixed within 24 hours and immediately placed a repair order with the maintenance department. Yet, all of this was observed by T-Bag of the escape team. He quickly found Charles and Benjamin because there was a large hole behind the sink, which was the escape route Michael had spent over a month creating. If an inmate moved in or the repair staff came, their escape plan would be completely exposed. In a rush, Benjamin found Roy and agreed to book the room for $500, but $500 was not a small amount. Although Benjamin made quite a bit by dealing drugs in prison, he had to have his underlings collect the messy outstanding debts from fellow inmates before anything else. Unexpectedly, the subordinate Benjamin trusted the most. After receiving the money, bribed others and ousted Benjamin from the gang for being a black man always hanging out with whites. Not to mention giving Benjamin a beating. Benjamin was completely out of options. Charles didn't say he didn't have the money. He had it stashed outside the prison. T 
teabag thought of a solution, the Mexican gang, which almost every night gambled in the kitchen, with his years of experience. Teabag was a master of cheating at cards, but gambling needed capital too. Suddenly, Charles remembered he had given Michael a Bible with his only $100 bill inside, which should still be in Michael's room, pretending to check out the room. I'll give you a hundred bucks for it. You wasted my time. Get the hell out of here. Sorry, boss. I thought it was a good bid. Charles sneaked away with the Bible, then handed the hundred dollars to Teabag. The survival of the escape team hung on the outcome of tonight's poker game. On the other hand, Michael's observation at the mental hospital reveals the cause of Haywire's dementia. It turned out to be because of the medication he was on. So, after Haywire took his pills, Michael would help him vomit them out. <laughs> As the medication in his system lessened, Haywire's memory gradually returned. With Michael's relentless efforts, Haywire finally recalled past details and, relying on memory, redrew the tattoos on Michael's back. But at the same time, Haywire also remembers that Michael stole his toothpaste and framed him. More fatally, Haywire guessed the tattoos were a map for escaping. Now, do I tear this up? Or do you tell me exactly where and when you're doing this? With no other choice, Michael had to reveal the escape plan and promise to take Haywire with them. Unexpectedly, Haywire took the map and attempted to escape on his own that night. But Haywire only knew the route, not about the security systems. He didn't make it 10 meters before being caught on the spot. He's trying to escape After successfully getting the drawings, Michael found Sarah and claimed he was cured, asking her to help him return to the cell block. But Sarah told him that Pope had ordered if he didn't disclose who burned him, Michael would still be placed in solitary upon leaving. The situation was at a standstill once again. Teabag lived up to his reputation. With perfect coordination with Benjamin, they quickly won the needed $500. The next day, Benjamin handed the full amount to Roy. But Roy, shamelessly, raised the price to $700, threatening to keep the existing $500 if not paid. Benjamin had no choice but to ask Charles to give up his gold watch as collateral, but Roy was shameless to the core. Your problem is somebody already gave me $700 for sale, so you're SOL. So both sides were in a bind. Fortunately, Lincoln, who was also in solitary, thought of a plan, through Monch. He coordinated with Michael and three outside to sneak the burnt uniform into Roy's locker. Then Michael volunteered that Roy had abused him. Not only that, but Roy had also been extorting money from inmates and even forcefully took Charles's gold watch. Pope despised corruption among his staff above all else. Furious, he stormed into the guard's locker room, finding $500, the burnt uniform, and Charles's gold watch in Roy's locker. With the evidence against him, Roy was immediately fired. As he was leaving, Roy also suffered Bellic's mockery. Don't look at me like I'm some con. You're as crooked as scoliosis. I don't get caught. After this incident, Michael and Sucre finally returned to their cell as they had wished. They began to plan their next steps for the escape. However, just then, a bus carrying a new batch of inmates arrived at Fox River State Penitentiary. Among them was John, the man Teabag had slashed and who had now returned. Fully healed, sending Teabag into a panic. Every return to his cell marked the beginning of David's nightmare. She only got one thing I need. Afterward, David would always hide alone in a corner. Consumed with self-loathing, he wasn't inherently evil. It was just his luck of not knowing the value of a baseball card he accidentally stole, leading to a five-year sentence and becoming someone else's outlet for sexual release. At this moment, Michael approached him, wanting David's help in stealing something critically important. Over a month, Michael had successfully created an escape route. Due to a previous path being blocked, the escape plan had to be rerouted through the psychiatric ward's sewer pipes then to the far end of the second floor medical ward, and down a 30-foot hallway to the medical ward. The final step was escaping via the medical ward's external cables. But the plan was missing one last piece, obtaining the key to open the medical ward's door. Michael approached David with the intention of having him steal Sarah's keys. In exchange, David wanted Michael to find someone to eliminate Avocado, the inmate abusing him. However, Michael, not one to cause trouble, could not agree to the deal. 
With no other option, Michael decided to take advantage of his medical visit to steal Sarah's keys himself. Yet, upon seeing Sarah's meticulous care, Michael impulsively kissed her, revealing his love. Wait for me. It won't always be like this. In this room. In this place. In the end, Michael couldn't bring himself to proceed with the theft. Meanwhile, John, since returning to Fox River State Penitentiary, seemed like a changed man. He prayed devoutly every day and even approached Teabag, seeking reconciliation. Does not a warm hand feel better than a cold shack? <laughs> you got a point there, John. Yeah. <laughs> but John called his outside contacts instructing them to arrange a three-seater helicopter. You only got three seats. I thought you said there were seven or eight guys. Well, not everybody gonna have a ticket. You gonna tell me who is? The three who are still breathing. On the outside, a woman claiming to be an old acquaintance of Michael found Sarah, saying she had important information about Michael. Sarah, fond of Michael, followed Nika to a cafe. But Nika was vague and, after speaking only a few words, hurriedly left. Listen, could I just have a contact number for you in case I, don't I think see that's something a good wrong? Idea. Please don't tell him that we met. I, I... It turned out Michael had once helped Nika, prompting him to call and ask her to steal Sarah's keys. After stealing the keys, Nika visited the prison and passed them to Michael. On the other side, Avocado, following his routine, attempted to abuse David again. While Avocado was making the bed, David pulled out a blade he had prepared and cut off Avocado's genitals. <sighs> The incident quickly spread throughout the prison. Sucre informed Michael about what happened. Avocado is saying he got cut on the frame while he was hopping down off his bunk. Yeah. Why did he lie? He doesn't want Twinner to go to the shoe. Because he can't get him in there. All I have to say is, as soon as Avocado gets out of the infirmary, Twinner is a dead man. Michael has been racked with guilt because he didn't send David to the P.I. after he helped him steal the watch. Knowing Avocado's return would plunge David back into a living hell, Michael considered taking David with him in the escape. However, Michael celebrated too soon. Sarah, no fool, connected Nika's strange behavior at the cafe to her missing keys after returning to her office. She then checked the visitation records for the day and indeed found Nika had visited Michael. Even though Michael managed to return the keys, it was already too late. Sarah realized she had been a pawn in Michael's plan from the beginning, and his confession of love had ulterior motives. Even though she didn't know what Michael wanted from her, Sarah changed the locks of the door with a broken heart. Seeing the locksmith, Michael's heart sank, but the real despair was yet to come. David, knowing about the escape, didn't plan to leave with them but used the information as leverage to get Bellic to change his room. They're escaping. Bellic arrived at the restroom, and indeed, he discovered the large hole under the floor used for the escape. This completely exposed the escape plan. This has got to be the boldest prison break crew in the world. They had the audacity to dig the escape tunnel right in the guard's break room. Upon receiving the tip off, the prison guard captain, Bellic, didn't waste a second before heading there. He lifted the sofa and the carpet, and sure enough, found a well-concealed large hole in the floor. But just at that moment, Charles from the escape team smacked down with a shovel. But Bellic, being a police academy grad, grabbed the shovel and engaged Charles in a fight to the death, perhaps driven by a fierce will to survive. The aging Charles grabbed a water bottle nearby and smashed it hard against Bellic's forehead. Finally, Charles knocked Bellic unconscious, but in the scuffle, Charles's abdomen was accidentally cut by glass. After quickly treating his wounds, Charles hurriedly threw the unconscious Bellic into the hole, immediately cleaned up his room, and informed the escape team of the incident. We gotta get out of here. Now. Everyone was stunned upon hearing the news. Michael had planned to break out in three days, 
But now they had to act immediately. Once the guards realized that Belik was missing, they would surely lock down the prison until they found him, at which point they would have no way out. Michael decisively announced the next steps of their escape plan. John was to contact the plane outside to take them away from the country. Benjamin was tasked with getting as much bleach as possible for later use. Everyone else was to find ways to mask their body odor to avoid police dog tracking. He himself would figure out how to get the keys to the infirmary, since the hole in the guard room was blocked by the unconscious Belloc. Escaping from there was no longer feasible, they could only wait until 7 o'clock tonight for yard time, when everyone would gather in front of Michael's cell to escape through the tunnel behind his cell sink, and with only one hour of yard time, they had to make every second count. Sucre didn't forget to remind Michael, your brother Lincoln is in solitary confinement, under 24-hour surveillance, even if you can't get Lincoln out tonight, we still have to go. Don't let so many of us die for one person, Michael nodded reluctantly. By lunchtime, the guards had already started to wonder why they hadn't seen Belik all morning. Michael, with ears pricked and heart racing, feeling guilty towards David. Michael, knowing full well it was David who snitched to Belik, still informed David that they were going to break out tonight. Whether to go or stay was up to David. After lunch, Michael took the opportunity while changing bandages to find Sarah and told her his entire plan. I'm getting my brother out of here. Tonight. And I need your help. Sarah was shocked to hear this. After calming down, Sarah questioned what Michael expected to get from her. Michael told Sarah that when he first arrived in prison, he indeed saw Sarah as a pawn for his escape. But later, he truly wanted to be with Sarah. Today, he came to Sarah only to ask her to make a small mistake. Please don't lock up after work. Sarah was in an intense mental struggle. She ran out the door without giving Michael a positive response. After leaving the infirmary, Pope found Michael, thanking him profusely for completing the Taj Mahal model. Pope said I owe you a favor and if you need anything, please don't hesitate to ask. Actually, there is one thing you can do for me. Thus, Michael got another chance to see his brother in solitary. Michael revealed his plan to escape tonight. Lincoln told him to leave him alone because he was in chains and there was nothing Michael could do to get him out of here. Michael was torn with agony. If he couldn't get his brother out, what was the point of planning this escape for over a month? John, seizing the moment when the guards were not paying attention, stealthily grabbed two handfuls of feces and hid them in his pockets. He then went to his cell and scattered the feces on his own bedsheet. His cellmate was utterly bewildered by John's series of actions. It's not in a place to question his will. Are we clear? On the other side, Teabag, during lunchtime, was also collecting beans that smelled like feces. He mashed these stinky beans into a slurry and smeared it on his bedsheets and pillow. You might think they are fools, but on the contrary, they are members of a highly intelligent prison escape team. Tonight, the escape team, consisting of eight people, is preparing to initiate their plan. They used feces to mask their own scent to avoid being tracked by the police dogs. Benjamin's task was to procure enough hydrogen peroxide, which was a key part of the escape plan, because the escape route would take them through the psychiatric ward. They needed to bleach their blue prison uniforms white. He hid the bleach in small pouches inside his trouser legs, then smuggled it out of the kitchen to distribute to the other members. Now, with only 45 minutes left until yard time, they were getting ready to make their escape during this period. However, as Sucre was bleaching his clothes, a guard suddenly approached. Sucre, frightened, immediately took off his pants and sat on the toilet. The guard informed Michael that Pope needed to see him urgently, seeing the key figure being taken away at this critical moment. The other members showed a look of utter despair, because just this morning, Belik had discovered the big hole they had dug for their escape. Fortunately, Charles appeared in time to knock him out and hide him in the pipes beneath the hole. They wondered if Pope had discovered this, but when Michael was taken to the office, he clearly heard Pope on the phone with Bellick's family, saying he was not at home today. Pope immediately ordered a search for Bellick in the prison and then called Michael to his office. Fortunately, Pope's concern was not about Bellick's disappearance, and Michael's hanging heart finally fell. Pope mentioned that this afternoon, while moving a model of the Taj Mahal, the supporting beam suddenly broke, and he asked Michael what had happened. Unexpectedly, Michael placed the stolen brace on the table and then pulled out a small knife, pointing it at Pope. And you're gonna make sure my brother goes with me. All of this was part of Michael's calculation. He wanted to be summoned by Pope as a part of his plan to save his brother, Lincoln. Michael threatened Pope to call his subordinates and say that Belloc had been sent to the city by him and was safe. 
and would return tomorrow. Then, he had Pope transfer Lincoln to the infirmary to ensure Lincoln would be there all night. After using Pope, Michael tied him up and hid him in a closet. Finally, he dialed a hotline for an entertainment program and then told the secretary outside that Pope was on a conference call and did not want to be disturbed. Seeing the phone line busy, and because Michael often came and went from there, the secretary had no suspicions. Back in the cell, the escape team anxiously awaited the arrival of 7 o'clock, feeling as though every minute and every second was unbearably long. Dear time, one hour! The yard time lasts for an hour, during which they must escape from the prison. Everyone, understanding the urgency, hurriedly gathered in front of Michael's cell. As Sucre pulled down the curtain, they one by one crawled into the large hole behind the water tank. However, not far into the sewer, they were met with deafening screams. Oh! It turned out that Bellic had awakened and successfully ripped off the tape on his mouth. Meanwhile, Two guards outside the restroom seemed to have heard the cries for help and hastily turned back. In a critical moment, Teabag quickly crawled over, covered Bellick's mouth, and pressed a knife against his throat. There's nobody here, man. I swear I heard something. Come on, let's go. After narrowly escaping, Michael stripped off Bellick's uniform and wore it himself. The group of eight vented the humiliation they had endured over the years. Shut your mouth. You know he's They arrived at a manhole cover beneath the yard. Next, they had to cross the most dangerous place. As three watchtowers were monitoring the area, Michael instructed everyone to put on the bleached prison uniforms and left in a hurry after saying, Wait here for me for a minute. Michael took out a handful of flour from his pocket and gently blew it towards a keypad. After several attempts of trial and error, he finally triggered the fire alarm in the psychiatric ward. At this moment, Teabag, thinking they were being set up, urgently told everyone to turn back. What fool, do you hear that? It's the fire alarm in the psych ward. How do you know? I set it off. Why? Soon, the inmates of the psychiatric ward began to exit the building, and Michael and his team waited under the manhole cover for their chance. When the control room declared the alarm a false alarm and ordered the psychiatric patients back inside, the escape team blended into the crowd. Wait a minute. The manager recognized John and questioned why Michael was there. Listen, you got that sedative you were talking about? Yeah. You got some now? Yeah. Let's have it. This will put him out right. Like a light. <gasps> the group safely made it through the sewers of the psychiatric ward and arrived at the infirmary. Here, they successfully met up with Lincoln. Whoa, 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 he... Uncuff my brother. Got it, boss. And I ain't here, boss. Yeah, even the radio. However, at that moment, Teabag noticed handcuffs on a chair and decided to take them, thinking they might come in handy later, unbeknownst to him. These handcuffs would eventually cost him a hand. The group of nine successfully reached the infirmary door. What remained to be seen was whether Sarah had left the door open for Michael. At this moment, all they needed to do was pull down the anti-theft window in the infirmary to escape over the prison walls using the cable. Michael came up with a plan. He directed everyone to the floor's fire escape to take out the fire hose, one end of which was tied to the anti-theft window. A blanket was laid on the ground to muffle the huge noise caused by the window hitting the ground. The other end was tied to the elevator's handrail. Using the massive pulling force generated by the descending elevator to tear off the anti-theft window, however, just as Michael pressed the button to go downstairs, the elevator's sensor system detected an obstruction and couldn't close. Now, with only 15 minutes left until the end of yard time, if they failed to escape within 15 minutes, the rest of their lives for all nine of them would be over. At this critical moment, David, feeling guilty, 
bravely entered the elevator and kept his hand on the lower floor button, successfully closing the elevator door. As the elevator descended, the fire hose gradually tightened. Just as Michael had anticipated, the anti-theft window was finally pulled down, just as everyone was taking off their prison uniforms, preparing to climb the cable, a person suddenly appeared at the door, staring intently at them. Here I come with... Look, oh. want me to make a little person-to-person -person call here? It turned out to be Michael's mentally ill cellmate, Haywire. Haywire threatened to join the escape team, leaving them no choice but to agree to take him along. Lincoln was the first to climb the cable to deal with the electrified fence on the wall. John suggested climbing the cables in alphabetical order, and since his name was Abruzzi, he was naturally first in line. The others, though angry, could not complain, as they were counting on his plane to leave the country. However, they didn't notice that the bolt fixing the cable had quietly loosened. Lincoln climbed to the wall and laid a sheet over the electric fence. After everything was prepared, Lincoln waved, and the others began to climb the cable one by one. However, at that moment, Charles suddenly couldn't hold on and fell to the ground. It turned out that in the morning's struggle with Bellick, Charles was accidentally deeply cut by glass in the abdomen and was now severely infected. Charles knew he didn't have the strength to climb the cable. He told Michael about a stash of money buried somewhere in a cellar in Double K Town in Utah. The money was not the reported one and a half million dollars but five million dollars. Charles hoped that Michael would take the money and leave half for his daughter, and the rest could be divided among them. Michael solemnly nodded, while Teabag licked his lips greedily. Meanwhile, outside Pope's office, the secretary sensed something was wrong as Pope's phone had been busy for too long. She, along with the guards, entered Pope's office and found Pope tied up in the closet. Uh, I have a call to be in the warden's office. I repeat, call on the alarm. Pep's on the base. Right now, no. Sound the alarm. Right the entire prison immediately went into lockdown. Guards with dogs searched everywhere for Michael and the others. By then, only three people had not escaped. Michael, Charles, and Monch. By name, Michael was before Monch. Michael climbed the cable, with Lincoln on the other side, his heart nearly bursting from his chest. Fortunately, the spotlight from the watchtower did not sweep over them. However, as Michael was about to reach the other side, an anxious Monch couldn't wait any longer and also climbed onto the cable. But Monch, with his body weighing 500 pounds, had just climbed onto the cable when the bolt securing it could no longer bear the weight and fell off. Michael was left hanging in midair. Lincoln reached out but couldn't grab his brother. As Monch got up to continue escaping, the guards had already spotted him. When the warder looked up the cable, Michael had been successfully rescued by his brother. Under interrogation, Monch revealed the names of the eight-person escape team. Pope went to the infirmary and found Charles had committed suicide. The prison inmates, upon learning someone had successfully escaped, all plunged into jubilation. Pope knew that if he couldn't bring them back, he and the entire Fox River State Penitentiary would be forever nailed to the pillar of shame. Twelve minutes had passed since the escape, and he gathered all the guards for a comprehensive search of the escapees, even authorizing them to shoot on sight if necessary. Bellick was also rescued from the hole, demanding his subordinates bring him a shotgun, vowing to regain the dignity that had been trampled upon. Pope never expected that Michael and the others were squatting in the bushes not far away, deliberately waiting for the guards to leave before making their escape. The most dangerous place is often the safest. No one would think that the fugitives were not ahead of them but behind them. Moreover, with the various scents of horse manure and stinky beans on them, the dogs could not track them at all. But the problem was Haywire, who was the last to join them and had not removed the scent from his body. Taking Haywire was akin to having a GPS locator on them. Therefore, the group pretended to send him to find car keys and quietly ditched Haywire. Meanwhile, the atmosphere inside the car was exceptionally tense. Teabag noticed that John had specifically chosen to sit directly behind him. His intuition was correct. John pulled out a gun from under the seat, intending to kill Teabag in revenge for the throat slash he had received before. But Teabag was prepared. He suddenly pulled out handcuffs and handcuffed himself to Michael. You think that will stop me? Did I? Think twice. Don't hmm? You shoot me. 
pretty good. We're dragging around 170 pounds of dead Alabama flesh with him. And considering how much you need him to get this little Fibonacci vendetta of yours, huh? Sean was counting on Michael to reveal the location of the witness. If Teabag died, Michael would not be able to get far. So he had to hold back his anger for now and head to the airport first. At this moment, they were five kilometers away from the airplane's docking point, and boarding the plane would allow them to successfully leave the United States. However, what they did not know was that John had only reserved three seats on the plane. That is, apart from Michael and Lincoln, John had no intention of taking the other four on the plane. On the prison side, investigators quickly discovered that the door to the infirmary had not been forced open at all. Clearly, someone had intentionally left the door open for the escapees. Pope, using the position of his colleagues in the infirmary as leverage, finally learned that Sarah had feelings for Michael. It was obvious that Sarah had intentionally let them go. However, when the police arrived at Sarah's house, they found her in a deep coma from an overdose of morphine. The police immediately called for an ambulance and took her to the hospital. On the other hand, Veronica, after a long investigation, found that Caroline had bought a villa by a remote lake which must hide some unspeakable secrets. Veronica quietly walked into the room alone and found a decadent man sleeping. Veronica was certain that this man was Caroline's brother, supposedly murdered by Lincoln. It turned out to be a thorough frame-up. Caroline did this because her brother was originally the CEO of a new energy company. Caroline created the illusion of her brother's fake death to embezzle the company's assets and use the money to support her presidential campaign. Lincoln was just a small sacrifice in this political maelstrom. On Michael's side, in order to avoid checkpoints along the way, they had to take detours, but not long after, the car got stuck in the mud. With only two kilometers left to their destination, they had to run the rest of the way. During this time, Michael also ditched David, because he knew that David had betrayed them. Helping him get out of prison was no longer a debt owed. The remaining few came to a warehouse, knowing that Michael and Teabag handcuffed together could not run fast. Lincoln and the others decided to forcefully open the handcuffs by pinning Teabag to the ground. But Sucre, despite using all his strength, could not budge them at all. John thought it was too much trouble and went straight for it with an axe. And so, Teabag lost a hand. The group of five left Teabag behind and ran towards the airstrip. But what they did not know was that police helicopters had already been positioned near the plane. John's subordinate felt something was amiss and had already missed the agreed time. Fearing he might also get caught if he waited any longer, he chose to leave first. When the five arrived, they could only watch the plane take off. With police sirens blaring nearby, they could only start a new round of desperate escape. We run. 